Oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Greg. Good to see all of you beautiful people. Yes. Welcome. I always enjoy hearing your greeting. Someone said Joyce is our official greeter, I think. And, uh, kind of get <laughs> well, well, it's the only time I see anybody. So. <laughs> no, it's so important. And you do a great job, Joyce. Well, thank you. Let me welcome uh, everyone here. Um, if by chance there is someone here for the first time, we're I know, but I you with us, and we pray that this service will be a blessing upon you. Um, before we get started, let me remind the congregation this is communion. If you have not already uh, gotten some bread and something to drink for the elements, you could do that at some point before we have communion, which will be after the sermon. This Sunday is the second Sunday in Advent, and we're thinking about peace. Um, before I say any more about that, I'd like to say um, that as we mentioned last week, before we began the service, um, uh, that we have a very significant pastoral event that's happened. Um, and even though we're going to think about peace today in this service as a part of our Advent journey, we know that the whole service has cast around us our compassion and love for Joanne McKim and the children. I'm yeah. sure all of you have heard that Daniel and I this past uh, program this week. I also have heard that we will be having a memorial service for Dana this coming Saturday on, uh, on Zoom at 11 o'clock. That's 11 o'clock. Uh, on Zoom. Let me uh, ask Tessa to put up the cover of Wilson. Our theme for the day is um, the peace uh, of Christ that comes. Um, and the name of the sermon is The Highest and Holiest Place. As you uh, consider that image that you see before you, I invite you to look at the centering thoughts as you prepare to worship God. And Nancy Wilkerpenning will lead us in some centering music. Let us worship God. We have lit the first candle, one for hope. Today we light the second candle, the candle of peace. We light it knowing full well that peace is elusive and in some parts of the world it is almost completely absent. Yet in this season of Advent, we trust that God is never absent from us. God is always preparing something new, and even where there is war and discord, 
whether between countries, within families, or within our own hearts, God is present, gently leading us to new possibilities. Please let's join each other in prayer. Loving God, in this time of preparation and planning, we thank you for the hope and peace you unfailingly offer us. Show us the creative power of hope. Teach us the peace that comes from justice. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you, that we may walk in the light of Christ. Amen. People, look east, the time is near of the crowning of the year. Make your house fair as you are able. Trim the heart and set the table. People, look east and sing today. Love, the guest is on the way. It's time to share the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. And also with you. Also with you. All right. Now, as we prepare to hear the word preached, we have some beautiful music, special music from Nancy Corcoran.
Thank you so much, Nancy. How beautiful. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you today in this service to receive the gifts of this music, to sing together, to commune together with the Lord's Supper. We bring with us all of ourselves, all that causes us excitement and joy, and all that causes us to be weighed down and heartbroken. We cannot sort that out, but we trust that being together and hearing your word, listening to your music will patch our hearts, give us strength, and make us fit to follow you in service. So bless us now as we seek to engage with your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, that was sort of a long prayer of illumination, wasn't it? You know, the Christmas event is not simple. As a matter of fact, it is very complex. And in Advent, as we approach this epic anniversary, we do well to open ourselves to as much of the depth and breadth of the meaning of Christmas as we can, as we can. Last week, for instance, we tried to open ourselves to a very personal meaning of Advent that we, all of us, are called to be Jesus in this hurting world. And today we'll turn to another dimension of the meaning of Christmas, but it is much broader. It is much more cosmic in scope. One of the great experiences of my life was a wilderness backpacking trip that I took with my daughter Erin, oh, about a decade ago. It was in the Roosevelt National Forest in the Rocky Mountains, near Rocky Mountain National Park. And on that trek, I reached the highest elevation that I have yet achieved in my life, 11,700 feet. But from that place, stretched out before me and above me, were peaks higher still. Some of the famed 14ers of Colorado, mountains that are 14,000 feet or taller. The picture that Tessa showed you on the front of the bulletin was the highest 14er in Colorado. It is reported and maybe some of you can attest to this, that almost every climber who summits a mountain experiences something spiritual and holy. What is it about mountains and wanting to go to the highest place, risking life and limb? Perhaps we yearn for it in hopes that it might be that there we will come to some sort of final answer, some sort of ultimate source of being. Our scripture is from the prophecy of the book of Isaiah. Listen as he reflects on this phenomenon. The mountain of God's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised up above the hills. All the nations, all the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, that God may teach us God's ways and that we may walk in God's paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of God will go out from Jerusalem. God shall judge between the nations. God shall arbitrate for many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn how to do war anymore. This text is one of the formative scriptures of our Bible. 
and a classic reading at Advent. Now, there are two clues to this text being central to our faith, to my faith and to your faith. First is the phrase, latter days. What does that mean? This does not mean in some far off, far removed day, like a second coming kind of day, a day that is remote and removed from us. Rather, Isaiah means here the latter days are when we are finally ready for the ultimate truth and the final wisdom. For those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, it will be a here and now kind of day. The second clue of the centrality of this passage to our faith as Christians is the word judge. Now, what does that mean? First, here's what it doesn't mean. Guilty or not guilty. This is a meaning that we in our time have laid upon this passage. But for Isaiah, God's judgment does not condemn or impose guilt. Rather, he means by judge that God sets us on the right path. God sees us, we're teetering, we're ready to fall, and she reaches out her hand to steady us. It's like God is saying, here, this is what I mean, and not that. That's what Isaiah means by judging. We progressives understand this as universal, encompassing encompassing not just Israel, but expanding to Christians, expanding to everyone, all the nations, Jews and Hindus and Muslims, all the nations of the world flow to the holy mountain. And for all of us in our own faith traditions, our own languages and rituals, what we hear is the final word. It is the ultimate word. Here, God says, this is what I mean and intend for human existence. Nations shall not lift up their swords against other nations. Neither shall they learn how to make war. But they shall beat their spears into a tool to prune the small fruit trees and their swords into a cutting edge of a plow to raise food. The Creator, Yahweh, Allah, the Source, whatever your name is for God, calls humanity to the highest place to dispense to us the holiest word. And God says in that moment, no more war. Rather, grow food. Wow. This is not exactly the way that our world sees it, is it? Evidence is everywhere. Violent video games. You know, probably, that they're a top seller at Christmas time. In them, our young are given instruction manuals in how to kill and maim other human beings. That is a pretty good mirror of the world's truth. The world's truth is that doing violence is the answer. Or it is a fact that fundamentalists of just about every religion see apocalyptic wars as caused, as sanctioned by God. And governments like ours, influenced by religious inclinations, seem to fall under the hypnotic spell of the glittering, shiny new toys of war, much like a video game. And then to get our approval to use these weapons, they appeal to us how they always want to talk to us about being realistic. Look, be realistic. That is to say, They say it's a violent world. You must kill or be killed. 
Appealing to the realism this way is another word for the status quo, the way things are. And friends, as you may have noticed, this is a winning political strategy. And the reason it is so effective is because it plays to our fears. And we, bless our hearts, human creatures are so subject to being afraid. And in our scriptures, also, there are other passages in the Old Testament that seem to bless war. I realize that. But friends, just as the core of the teaching of Jesus is love and inclusion, that everyone is included and involved, just as that teaching by Jesus is a higher authority than Leviticus, where Leviticus teaches that we are to exclude GLBTQ people, just in that way, this passage of Isaiah is ultimate truth. It is ascendant over other parts of our scripture. In the latter days is what Isaiah is saying. When it's time for God to set us right on the highest mountain, which is the place we go to be closest to God, this is an ultimate word in Isaiah. And then to put an exclamation point on it, God gave us the place of Bethlehem. By the way, the elevation is 2,543 feet, yet in our faith tradition, it is the highest and the holiest place. The cow walks into the barn like she has every night of her bovine life and heads for her feeding trough, chewing her cud in anticipation, in hunger, but she stops. Whoa, there is something in her feeding box that is not food. It is actually moving and making noise. Her ears tilt forward to listen. Her nostrils flare to smell. Her eyes widen to see. What is it, this baby? What potential does this defenseless, helpless, omnipotent being have that all creation grows still and wonders and is transfixed. The Prince of Peace, that is what this baby is named on this Peace Sunday in Advent. The Prince of Peace. Drones. Drones, they, according to some in our world, are the ultimate solution that we have come up with for war. That impersonal, long-distance killer is evidently humanity's best attempt at a final answer. But God's answer is not impersonal. It is not a long-distance killer, but an up-close baby with a soft spot on the top of his head. God says, I am in this baby, and I am in every baby killed by drones. And we who follow Jesus, we reject roundly realism. You can say to your realistic acquaintance who says that you are uh, being idealistic, well, tell me, sir, how has realism worked out for you so far in the world? What we are to do is to beat the swords and spears into hoes and rakes and to feed babies and not to kill them. The question is often asked, I've asked it many times in sermons, what is the meaning of Christmas? It is, friends, the claim that the creator of the universe looks back at us through unfocused eyes of a newborn. And while there is more than one answer as to what Christmas means, the central, core, vital, prime answer is this. Stop killing babies and feed babies. Feed all the babies. 
I was looking online and was interested to read some about the open door. Maybe some of you know that Chris Albright, who is one of our new elders, works at the open door. Let me just read to you something. The Open Door is a hunger relief organization dedicated to ending local hunger through healthy food. Through its collective programs, the Open Door serves more than 6,000 Dakota County residents each month, distributes over 1 million pounds of food annually, 70% of which is fresh. Clients are able to access healthy food choices through a fixed site food pantry in Egan, multiple mobile pantry sites, the mobile lunchbox, and the garden to table program. Scripture says, come to the highest mountain, to the holiest place. And in the latter days, hear this truth. Every child is a peace child. Every child is meant to be fed. Who would have thought that the open door was the highest and the holiest place? For this is the way God comes into the world, not the prince of the military industrial complex, but the prince of peace. Amen. Let us lift up our hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give God our thanks and praise. Alleluia. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all, from the very beginning, from before there was even a beginning, you were. You loved all into being in a God moment, a point, a flash, 
and aha. And from that moment, all creation has expanded and grown, alleluia. And you created us, humankind, people of every shape and size, young and old, with our wondering and our wandering, with our fears and our hopes, with our joys and our pains. And you have loved us and you still love us, alleluia. Oh God, so often we stray from your hopes for us, your hopes that we might seek justice, that we might love each other, that we might love you. Over and over again, you send teachers, grandmothers and grandfathers, prophets, priests and storytellers to call us back to your love. And then when the time was right, you sent the Christ to live with us, to know in the way that we know every moment of every day of what it means to be a human. In Jesus, questions got asked, answers were given, tears were shed, laughter erupted, and the cry for your lived love was shared again and again. God's kingdom is coming. God's kingdom is here in the vulnerability of a tiny baby born of a young mother and a rough carpenter, worshipped by the world's least and the world's powerful. He calls us back to your love. The Christ calls us back to your love every moment, every day. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was eating with his friends and he took bread. And after giving thanks to God for it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you the body of Christ. In the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant to shed in my blood. All of you drink of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the coming of the Lord Jesus. You may now take the cup. I am trusting that everyone on our call today has had, has been fed. Has everyone in the world been fed? Then let us pray. God of peace, God of bread, God of food pantries, God of children. We ask that you would take this meal that we have been given, that it will nourish our bodies and enliven our souls and make of us your servants in this world that you love so much that you gave your love. We pray in your holy name. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, we come now to our joys and concerns. Let us uh, conclude our prayer time uh, by reciting in unison the Lord's Prayer as it, you find it now on your screen. Let us pray together. Ground of all being, mother of life, father of the universe, your name is sacred, 
beyond speaking. May we know your presence. May your longings be our longings in heart and in action. Today, may there be food for the human family and for the whole earth community. Forgive us the falseness of what we have done as we forgive those who are untrue to us. Do not forsake us in our time of conflict, but lead us into new beginnings. For the light of life, the vitality of life, and the glory of life, are yours now and forever. Amen. And thanking the congregation for your responses to our stewardship campaign. As we keep that in mind, let us join together in a prayer, asking God's blessing on our gifts. Let us pray. O oh God, with joy and thanksgiving, we celebrate this opportunity to share. May we be signs of your reign of justice and peace, for which we watch, hope, and pray this season. Amen. And do any of you dear people have announcements? Okay, I think it's time for our uh, uh, benediction. So let me offer that for you. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God's countenance be lifted up upon you and grant you peace both this day and all of our days together. And let all God's people say, Amen.